this morning. We'll go ahead and try this one, Ivan. And I have to conclude. I am. I do not. Uh, I have to conclude this. I have to conclude that there, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic, and I won't waste a lot of the time from preaching, but if you want to know why I'm saying what I'm about to say, see me afterwards. There's somebody here who the devil does not want to hear this message. There it is. All right? And it's not just because it's mic thing. There's things that happened this morning. Uh, numbers of phone calls, all right? So um, I'm, I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit wants at least one person to get something very specific. And I don't know what it is, and I, I'm not, I don't need to know. But I need to preach what God, the message God gave me. And uh, you need to not allow anything to distract you from hearing what the Holy Spirit might be wanting to say to each of us, all right? And I include myself in that. Now, we're t starting a new series on perfect love, and today we're looking at the priority of love, the priority of love. The big idea, love is the highest display of the character of God. Love, say it with me, love is the highest display of the character of God. Say it one more time. Love is the highest display of the character of God. Now, why do I say that? Well, look at 1 John chapter 4, please. And if you're in the habit of marking your Bible, as I am, I would encourage you to mark 1 John 4, especially verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. There it is. God is love. Now watch what it says after that. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. He who abides in love abides in God and God in him. It's tragic that in many churches, the love that's basic to Christian character does not characterize the people or the ministry. Love was missing in Corinth. They had spiritual gifts. We know that from chapter 1, verse 7. He says, you're not lacking any gift. For the most part, their doctrine was okay. We know from chapter 11, verse 2. But love was absent. See, it's, that's the hard part. It's not hard to, be, to have orthodoxy. It's not hard to have truth. But what's hard for people is to have truth and love. Truth and love. Most of the time we go off balance as human beings on one or the other. We stand hard for the truth and we don't have a lot of love for people. We're judgmental and condemnatory. But oftentimes when we have a lot of love, we sometimes let that emphasis on love take us away from truth and, and think that truth doesn't matter. And what God says in this part of the Bible, that part doesn't matter, but you can't do that and be true to God's word. The Bible teaches that we have truth and we have love, but God is love. And because God is love, he wants us to be loving as he is. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which we're going to start looking at today, we're going to look at it for about four or five weeks. That's the greatest passage that the Apostle Paul ever wrote. 1 Corinthians 13 has been called the hymn of love. The hymn of love, a lyrical interpretation of the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes set to music. Studying it is somewhat like taking apart a flower. Part of the beauty is lost when the components are separated, yet when each part is understood more clearly, the whole can become even more beautiful. So it's a breath of fresh air, an oasis in a desert of problems. It's a positive note in the midst of almost continual reproof that Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He had to correct them for wrong understandings, wrong attitudes, wrong behavior, and wrong use of God's gifts. And it's right in the middle of a discussion, a lengthy discussion on spiritual gifts, which is chapters 12 to 14. 
Chapter 12 discusses the giving and the receiving and the interconnection of the gifts. And chapter 14 talks about the proper exercise of the gifts, especially the gift of tongues or languages. And here, right in the middle, right in chapter 13, between 12 and 14, we see the proper attitude and atmosphere, the proper motive and power, what Paul calls, and it, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 13 now if you would like to, what Paul calls the more excellent way. Notice the last line of verse 31 in chapter 12. He says, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. See, love is more excellent than feeling resentful and inferior because you do not have the showier and seemingly more important gifts. By the way, all the gifts are important. All the gifts are important. It's not just one gift. Some people, though, are resentful because they don't have the gift that somebody else has. Love is also more excellent than feeling superior and independent because you do have a gift that maybe other people would like to have. It's sad, but the spiritual life that's true is the one where the gifts of the Spirit operate, and they're not reflected in spiritual gifts, but spiritual fruit. Now, you notice that reference, Galatians 5.22. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? Am I known from memory? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit. The result of walking in the Holy Spirit is love. See, without the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit just operate in the flesh. and That, that becomes very counterproductive and counterfeit. So God gives us, through the fruit of the Spirit, the motivation and power. It's kind of like spiritual energy. Where do you, where do you get spiritual energy? Well, you've got to get it from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you're saved, indwells you. The Bible says our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost who is in us, which we have of God, and we're not our own. We're bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He says in Galatians 5.25, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Colossians 3.16, there's an interesting verse. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now watch this. That word dwell in Colossians 3.16, that's the same word that God uses over in Peter where he says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Dwell with them according to knowledge. In fact, David Jeremiah reminded everybody last night in a message on prayer that the tenth reason that sometimes prayers aren't heard is because of husbands not loving their wives. Did you know it was in the Bible? Yeah. It's 2 Peter 3. Husbands, give honor unto your wives as unto the weaker vessel that your prayers will not be hindered. And a lot of times we men forget that. God gives us wives to compliment us and help us. And God says to us, we're to honor them and, and live with them according to knowledge. And when we don't do that, our prayer life could be hindered. That's, a, that's a, a shocking fact that many men have forgotten about or never knew was in the Bible. But God wants to empower us, and he does it through his Holy Spirit. Now, who wrote the Bible? God did. Specifically. The Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by whom? The Holy Spirit. So the, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, you've got to know this book. If you don't know this book, you can't obey the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible and speaks to us primarily through His Word. Now the people at Corinth, the believers there, they weren't walking in the Spirit. They were selfish, they were self-designing, they were self-willed, they were self-motivated. They were doing everything to promote their own interest and welfare. Everyone was doing his own thing for his own good with no regard for others. And the most significant thing they lacked was love. Like the church at Ephesus. Remember that in, in Revelation, Paul writes, John writes rather, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, but Paul 
John wrote to the churches, the seven churches. And in Revelation 2, he speaks about the church at Ephesus. He said, this is, what the, this is what the angel says, the messenger says to the church at Ephesus. I have somewhat against you, the Lord says, because you have what? Left your what? First love. Left your first love. The believers at Corinth had left their first love for the Lord. Now, let's talk a little bit about the word love. Most of you know, it's that word that on the top of the screen, it looks like in English, a gape, but it's not a gape, okay? It's agape. Agape love. That's the highest form of love, and that's God's love. It's one of the rarest words in ancient Greek literature. It's one of the most common in the New Testament. Now, unlike our English love, it never refers to romantic or sexual love. That's the word eros. That word does not appear in the New Testament. And this love does not refer to mere sentiment, a pleasant feeling about something or someone. It doesn't mean close friendship or brotherly love. That's the Greek term phileo. We get our, we get our English word Philadelphia from that, city of brotherly love. You don't want to go in the wrong parts of that at night or you won't feel like there's brotherly love. Now, agape does not mean charity. That's The King James translated it charity, and they carried it over from the Latin, but that word has long been associated with only giving to the needy. This chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, is the best definition of agape love in the Bible. And that's why I'm not going to rush through it. Dr. Carl Menninger, the famous psychiatrist and founder of the Menninger Clinic, wrote these words, quote, love is the medicine for our old sick world. If people can learn to give and receive love, they will usually recover from their physical or mental illness, end quote. That's powerful. And that's from a guy who makes his living helping people. Manager Clinic. Love is the medicine for our old sick world. The problem, though, is that very few people have any idea of what true love is. Most people, including Christians, seem to think of it as only nice, warm feelings, fuzzy feelings, you know? Romance, desire, warm affection. When we say, I love you, we often mean, I love me and I want you. I love me and I want you. That's the worst sort of selfishness. That's the very opposite of agape love. Alan Redpath tells the story of a young woman who came to her pastor desperate and despondent. She said, there is a man who loves, says he loves me so much he will kill himself if I don't marry him. What should I do? Do nothing, he replied. That man doesn't love you, he loves himself. Such, such a threat isn't love, it is pure selfishness. Pretty insightful. Pretty insightful. Self-giving love. Love that demands something of us. Love that's more concerned with giving than receiving is as rare today as it was in Corinth. That's because agape love is so unnatural to human nature. Because our world has defined love as romantic feeling or attraction, which has nothing to do with true love in God's terms. The supreme measure and example of agape love is God's love. Now, notice another reference on the screen, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he had warm, fuzzy feelings toward everybody. Is that what it says? Oh, see, that's ridiculous. But watch. And see, there's somebody here this morning that's got a block. You have a mental block about loving somebody because you think it means that you have to have warm, fuzzy feelings for that person. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that at all. Okay? Love is not a warm feeling. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave that he gave his only begotten son. 
that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Next week, we're going to look at the qualities, start looking at the qualities of love. But I'll just touch on it briefly here this morning. Love, above all things, is sacrificial. Above all things, love is sacrificial. It's a sacrifice of self for the sake of others. Even for others who may care nothing at all for us, who may even hate us. So it's not a feeling. It's a determined act of will, which always results in determined acts of self-giving. Love is the willful, joyful desire to put the welfare of others above our own. It leaves no place for pride, vanity, arrogance, self-seeking, or self-glory. In fact, put a finger here in, in, Matthew, in 1 Corinthians 13, and I am going to get to the first three verses eventually. Go over to Matthew 5. I want to show you what, what Jesus said about love and how it can't be a feeling, a good feeling. It, it's not possible. Matthew chapter 5. Now notice Jesus is speaking here, and this is the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And in verse 43, he says, You have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but, circle the word but in verse 44. See, Jesus is saying to you, I'm going to show you a better way. But I say to you, love your enemies. Who's your enemy? Somebody that's against you. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you back, what reward have you? Doesn't even the tax collector do the same thing? And if you greet your brothers only, what, what's that? What good is that? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Pagans? Therefore, that's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you to be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. And he doesn't mean sinless there. He means mature in your love, complete. Now, maybe right now you're hung up and you say, well, Pastor Bill, look, that's not possible. You don't know what that person did to me, this enemy. I can't. I can't love them. All right, I grant you could feel that way. So in the, the way in the verse, how to get it is in the verse. Did you see that? It says, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So if there's somebody that the Holy Spirit brings to your mind this morning that you don't love like you know God wants you to, whether it's a friend or enemy, doesn't matter. I strongly recommend that you take something that you use in your prayer time and write down on a piece of paper with that the name of this person and make a promise to God before you leave church today that you're going to pray for that person 30 days in a row. Whether you see them or not, and not, nothing... Not even talking to the person. I don't mean that. Just you're going to talk to God every day and say, pray for, pray for that person. Say, God, today I pray for so-and-so. Help that person to be a better person. Help them to, watch this, be blessed. Ooh. Ooh. It says that, doesn't it? Bless those who persecute you. Help them to be blessed. And help me to love them like you love me. I guarantee you on the authority of the Bible, not because I know anything, because all I know is what the Bible says, but on the authority of the Bible, if you pray 30 days for somebody like that and mean it, you will not hate that person. God will change your attitude toward that person. Now, some people here won't do it because you know that'll happen. <laughs> Right. 
How about, how about you and I? Were we loving God when he loved us? No. The Bible says, God loved us while we were enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of his son, Romans 5.10. How much more should we love those who are our enemies? Now, at the Last Supper, Jesus took off his outer garments and began to wash the disciples' feet. What was that all about? It was a practical demonstration of love to those who, contrary to their master, were then thinking only of themselves. While Jesus was facing the agony of the cross, his unloving disciples argued about which one of them was the greatest, Luke twenty two twenty four. 24. So they were arguing, who's the greatest in the kingdom? So they weren't very attractive to Jesus at that point in time, were they? They were undeserving, selfish, and insensitive, but the Savior chose to love them supremely, and he taught them to love not in word but in deed. So in his kind act of washing the disciples' feet, he showed them that love is not an emotional attraction, but selfless, humble service to meet another's need, no matter how lowly the service or how undeserving the person served. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples what he said in John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give to you, you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know you're my disciples if you have a fish bumper sticker on the back of your car, right? Or honk if you love Jesus on the back of your car. Those are old bumper stickers. I don't know what the new ones say, the new, the new Christian bumper sticker. Now, he said, by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you have love one to another. Now, a lot of times it's not love, but it's shove. And he says, no, no, that's not what you need. You need love. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. John 15, 9, abide in my love. Now, how about the Apostle Paul? Romans 13, 8, 9. He who loves his neighbor, Paul tells us, has fulfilled the law for this. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Romans 13, 8 and 9. So lovelessness is behind all disobedience to the Lord, and love is behind all true obedience. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all you do be done in love. Let all you do be done in love. They say, well, I don't feel like that. I don't feel very loving. Well, we don't have to manufacture love. We only have to share the love we've been given. We don't have to be humanly taught to love. You know why? Because we ourselves are taught by God to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4.9. We're commanded in 1 Corinthians 14.1 to pursue love. In Colossians 3.14 to put on love. In 1 Thessalonians 3.12 to increase and abound in love. To be unified in love in Philippians 2.2. 2. To be fervent in love, 1 Peter 4.8. And to stimulate one another to love and good works, Hebrews 10.24. So there's five keys, if I could sum up this kind of agape love, five keys to loving like this. Number one, love is commanded. Number two, love is already possessed by believers. Number three, love is the norm of Christian living. Number four, love is the work of the Holy Spirit. And number five, love has to be practiced to be genuine. So it's commanded. We already have it. It's normal for a Christian. It's the work of the Spirit, but it has to be practiced to be genuine. You can't not do it and have it. Now let's jump into the text, all right? 1 Corinthians 13. And notice, as Paul begins admonishing the believers at Corinth, he uses hyperbole, considerable hyperbole here. Number one, eloquence without love, he says, is nothing. Eloquence without love. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So to make his point, he exaggerates the limit of imagination. Using a 
several different examples. He says, if somehow I were able to do or be to the absolute extreme, but did not have love, I would be absolutely nothing. And in the spirit of the love which he's talking about, Paul changes to the first person. He wanted to make it clear what he said applied as fully to himself as anyone in Corinth. And by the way, I realize this. When I preach, if I would go like this and point a finger at you, I got three fingers pointing back at me, all right? So we're all in this together. Eloquence without love is nothing. If I would stand up and, and make some eloquent, flowery speech and not have love, God says, forget it, zero, okay? It's nothing. Now, when Paul's talking here, he first imagines himself to speak with the greatest possible eloquence with the tongues of men and of angels. Now, what he's talking about here is language. He, he said, even though glossa can mean the physical organ of speech, it can also mean language, like it does when we speak of a person's mother tongue. Now, here in the context, there's no doubt that Paul includes the gift of speaking in languages. We know that from chapter 12, 10, and 28, and 14, 4 to 6, and 13, and 14. That's the gift the Corinthians prize so highly and abuse so greatly. I went verse by verse through chapter 14. If you'd like to know more about that, you can ask for the recordings of 1 Corinthians 14. Paul's basic point, though, here is to convey the idea of being able to speak all kinds of languages with great fluency and eloquence, far above the greatest linguist or orator. In other words, like if you would know five languages in the world, all right, French and Spanish and English and two other ones, and you could speak them all very, very, very fluently and eloquently. And yet, you did that with no love. He says, forget it. It's, not, it's nothing. And the fact that he, the, the way I know he's talking in general hypothetical terms, because it's clear from the expression that he uses tongues of angels. Now, listen, people say, what is that? Okay, let me explain it to you. There is no... Biblical teaching of a unique, special, angelic language or dialect. In fact, when the angels came to the earth, in all the records that you find in the Bible, they spoke what? The language of the people. So there isn't some special angel talk. There isn't some special heavenly language, okay? That doesn't exist. That's not what he's saying here. He's using hyperbole. He's simply saying that if he were to have the ability to speak with the skill and eloquence of the greatest man, even with angelic eloquence, he would only become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal if he didn't have love. And so what he's telling us is that the gift of speaking is especially meaningless without love. See, and, and watch this. You say, well, how does it refer to me? How does this apply to me? Because I'm not a speaker. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you ever tell God you love him? Do you ever tell anybody else you love him? See, we can say it, and we need to say it to one another. But if we only say it, and that's it, guess what? That's not it. It's not real. Now, we need to let people know of our love, but we need to show it. And that's what we're going to look at next week, see, the quality. So love is shown by action, and eloquence simply by itself is nothing. In New Testament times, they had pagan rites that were done by the heathen nations around them that honored the pagan gods of Sibeli and Bacchus and Dionysius. Those rites included speaking in ecstatic noises accompanied by smashing gongs and clanging cymbals and blaring trumpets. So Paul's hearers clearly got this point. Unless it's done in love, ministering the gift of languages or speaking in any other human or angelic way amounts to no more than these pagan rituals. It's only meaningless gibberish in a Christian guise. Number two, prophecy, knowledge, and faith without love are nothing. What's prophecy? Prophecy is proclaiming God's truth so that people can know and understand it. We know that from chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. Paul the Apostle himself was a prophet. He had the highest regard both for the office of prophet and the gift of prophecy. But continuing his hyperbole, 
Paul says that even the great gift of prophecy has to be ministered in love. The most gifted man of God is not exempt from ministering in love. If anything, he's the most obligated to minister in love. Luke 12, 48 says, From everyone who has been given much shall much be required. How about the prophet Balaam? You remember Balaam? He was a prophet of God. He knew the true God. He knew God's people. He knew God's truth, but he had no love for God's people. So with little hesitation, he agreed to curse the Israelites in return for a generous payment by Balak, the king of Moab. Because God could not convince his prophet not to do that terrible thing, he sent an angel to stop the prophet's donkey. You can read that story in Numbers 22, 16 to 34. Several other times, Balaam would have cursed Israel had he not been prevented by God. But what the prophet failed to do through cursing Israel, he accomplished by misleading them. Because he led Israel into idolatry and immorality, Balaam was put to death, Numbers 31, 8 and 16. So the prophet knew God's word, spoke God's word, and feared God in a self-protecting way, but had no love for God or for God's people. The story is told of a young Sunday school teacher who came to her pastor and said, I thought I really loved the girls in my class. I prepared my lesson carefully, tried to make everyone feel a part of the class, but I have never made any personal sacrifice for those girls. She sensed that with all her study of the Bible, her careful preparation of lessons and her nice feelings about the class members, she still lacked the key ingredient of agape love, love that's self-giving and self-sacrificing. See, when we, when we practice our teaching without love, it's just a lot of commotion, no matter how orthodox, persuasive, and relevant our words are. How about Jeremiah, his ministry? It was in stark contrast to Balaam's. He was a weeping prophet, not because of his own problems, which were great, but because of the wickedness of the people of Israel, their refusal to turn to God. He wept over them much like Jesus later wept over Jerusalem in Luke 19, 41 to 44. Jeremiah said, my sorrow is beyond healing. My heart is faint within me. For the brokenness of the daughter of my people, I am broken. I mourn. Though that my head were waters, my eyes a fountain of tears. I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah 8, 18. Paul also ministered with tears. He tells about his trials, but it wasn't the trials that made him cry. It was the people turning against the gospel. Acts 20, 19. You know the biggest thing that made Paul weep, though? And I'm convicted by this because it's hard for me to be honest and say that I've wept a lot, even though I try to be very zealous in, in winning souls and witnessing to people every day. Listen to what Paul said. This convicts me right to the core. Romans 9, 1 to 3. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ, for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Can you say that? I, I don't think I can. But what Paul's saying there is. I would give up my place in heaven. I'd be willing to forfeit heaven because I am so burdened for my countrymen, for my, my own people, that I want to see them saved. That's what he means when he says, I have great sorrow and continual heaviness in my heart. As a consequence of that, he ministered with great power because he ministered with great love. Now, not only is prophecy without love of no avail, but so is knowledge without love. Knowledge. He says, and though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. In the, in the Bible, the word mystery is a, is a truth that was hidden in the Old Testament, but revealed in the New Testament. And Paul insists, even if he could perfectly understand all the mysteries of God, he would still be nothing without love. In fact, that's why Paul said love puffs up, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, see? Knowledge without love is worse than mere ignorance. It produces spiritual snobbery, pride, and arrogance. 
it's pharisaic and ugly. Spiritual knowledge is good and beautiful and fruitful in the Lord's work if it's held in humility, but it's ugly and unproductive when love is missing. Paul here is not depreciating knowledge. In fact, he said about the Philippians, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, Philippians 1.9. So we need to know the Bible, but he's saying without love, knowledge doesn't avail anything. Only love brings real knowledge and all discernment. Love, then, is a divine edifier. Finally, faith without love is nothing. Faith without love. If Paul did not depreciate knowledge, even less did he depreciate faith. He's not speaking here, though, of saving faith, but of confidence and expectancy in the Lord. He's addressing believers who already have saving faith. All faith, so as to remove mountains, refers to trusting God to do mighty things on behalf of his children. It especially refers to believers who have the gift of faith, even with this wonderful gift from God of making the impossible possible. Paul says a Christian is nothing if he does not have love. It's not by coincidence that Paul uses the same figure of speech that was used on one occasion by Jesus. After his disciples left, failed to heal the demon-possessed boy, Jesus told them in Matthew 17, 20, Truly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it shall move. Now, we know that's hyperbole. You know how I know it? Because nobody ever moved any mountains. Now, there are a lot of people who had faith, okay? So Jesus was speaking in hyperbole just as Paul was. The Lord's point to his disciples here was that by trusting him completely, Nothing in their ministry would be impossible. Paul's point is that even if a person had that great degree of prayerful trust in the Lord, but wasn't loving, he would be nothing. Think about Jonah. Jonah had great faith. In fact, it was because of his great belief in the effectiveness of God's word that he resisted preaching to Nineveh. He was not afraid of failure, but he was afraid of success. Now, you might think that's weird to say that, but think about it. Jonah was afraid of success. His, he had great faith in the power of the, God's word, and his problem was he didn't want God to spare the wicked Ninevites. He didn't want them to believe and get saved. He did not want them to be spared by God. As the direct result of his powerful preaching, everyone in the city from the king down, repented. Even the animals were covered with sackcloth as a symbol of repentance. God miraculously spared Nineveh like Jonah knew he would. Then, listen to this. Here's one of the hardest, strangest, hard-hearted prayers in all the Bible. Jonah 4, 1 to 3. It greatly displeased Jonah. He became angry. And he prayed to the Lord said, Please, Lord, wasn't this what I said while I was in my own country? Therefore, to keep this from happening, I fled to Tarshish, because I knew you're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, he says, God, please take my life, for death is better to me than life. Man. The whole town got saved, and he was mad. Now, before we are too hard on Jonah, I got a question for you, a convicting question. And I ask it to myself. Think about this. Because this, this gets down to where the rubber meets the road. Is there any person that you know about, not necessarily that you know personally, but is there any person that you know about in the world that if they got saved, you wouldn't necessarily be happy about it? You wouldn't want to think about having to spend heaven with that person, eternity in heaven with that person. And you, you, Now, you may or may not be able to think of somebody like that, but here's how I know that's true. Because oftentimes, when we hear about some serial killer or somebody getting converted, what do we say? Oh, well, that's probably not really real. They don't really deserve that. Right? And that our, that's our reaction. Oh, man, that's garbage. Sorry. Sorry to be so blunt with you. But whenever, if, we, if you ever say or think that somebody doesn't deserve to get saved, 
you realize what you're saying. You're saying that person doesn't, and I do. And I'm better than all the other sinners. My sin's not as bad as others. That's, that's not true. That's, that's unbiblical. The Bible says all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not one. All of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. So no one deserves to be saved. I didn't deserve to get saved. Okay? God saved me by his grace. If you're saved today, then you are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And God wants you and I to show his love to other people like he showed it to us. Finally, number three, benevolence and martyrdom without love are nothing. Agape love is always self-sacrificing. Now, throughout the history of the church, certain groups and movements have believed that self-denial, self-mutilation, and even self-affliction in themselves bring spiritual merit. So there's a lot of groups that have put great emphasis on giving up possessions, on sacrifice various sorts, on religious acts of supposed self-deprivation, self-affliction, and monasticism. Even for Christians, however, such things are worse than worthless without love. In fact, without love, they're anything but selfless. The real focus of self, such practices is not God or others, but self. So what's benevolence without love? Well, the term there for give means to dole out in small quantities. And talking about a long-term systematic program of giving away everything one possesses. That ultimate act of benevolence, giving all one's possessions to feed the poor, would not be a spiritual deed if not done out of genuine love, no matter how great the sacrifice or how many people were filled. The rabbis taught that people did not ever need to give more than 20%. So Paul's illustration suggested unheard of generosity. Even so, the people who receive such generosity would be benefited by full stomachs, but the giver would be benefited by nothing. Giving from legalistic obligation, from desire for recognition and praise, or as a way to salve a guilty conscience, is worthless. Only love qualifies giving to be spiritual. In fact, Jesus' command to give secretly helps protect us from being tempted by some of those false, unspiritual, unloving motives. Benevolence with love is of great worth. Benevolence without love is nothing. Finally, what about martyrdom? Paul says, if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now, in keeping with the extremes he's been using in these verses, it's best to assume he's referring to being burned alive. And even though execution by burning at the stake, a fate suffered by many Christian martyrs, was not begun in the Roman Empire until some years later, yet that seems to be the form of suffering to which Paul refers, a horrible, agonizing death. In fact, it's hard to understand this, but when persecution of the early church became intense, some believers actually sought martyrdom as a way of becoming famous or gaining special heavenly credit. Much like the jihadists today think that they're going to get some kind of special reward if they you know, become a suicide bomber. When sacrifice is motivated by self-interest and pride, it loses any spiritual value. Even accepting agonizing death for the faith profits nothing if it's done without true divine love. No matter how much a person may suffer because of their Christian testimony and service, he has no spiritual gain if his witness and work are not ministered in love. And so what's Paul saying here? He's saying simply this. The loveless person produces nothing, is nothing, and gains nothing. He says, you and I need to love as God loved us. Now, as you bow our heads and close our eyes, I want you to take a moment before I pray and ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your memory right now with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want you to think about this. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring to your memory some person that you're not loving the way you know God would want you to love that person. Ask the Holy Spirit to bring that person to your memory. Okay? Now, as the Holy Spirit brings that person to your memory, I want you to pray and say, God, help me to do what it takes to love that person like you love me. Help me to pray for that person. And if you're willing, 
ask God, tell God that you'll pray for 30 days for that person. It might be a coworker. It might be somebody in your family. It might be an in-law. It might be a brother, a sister. I don't know who it is. It doesn't matter. God knows. I'm not telling you have to go out here and have coffee with them. I'm asking you if you'll love them like God loves you, okay? And ask God to bring that person to your memory and then pray and say, God, now help me to do what you tell me to do, to obey you. God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God. We love him because he first loved us. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven and loved you. Now, Jesus Christ died on the cross to show us his love for us. If you're here this morning and have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you'd like to, I can help you with that right now. I invite you to pray this prayer with me from your heart of heart to God's. Dear God, just silently from your heart to God's. Dear God, thank you for loving me, sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I ask him now to come into my life, forgive my sin, make me your child. Thank you for forgiving my sins, hearing my prayer. Help me now to not only accept your love, but share it with others. In Jesus' name I pray. Well, their heads still bowed and eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer and meant it with me, ask the Lord to save you today. He did. I'd like to thank him for doing that. If you'll let me do that. If you prayed with me a moment ago, would you lift your hand right now? By that raised hand, you're saying, yes, I prayed that prayer with you to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Maybe you've already done that before. Christian friend, did the Holy Spirit bring somebody to your mind? If he did, are you willing to pray for that person? Ask God to help you to love that person for Christ's sake? If you'd like to be remembered in my closing prayer, as we stand in a moment, would you lift your hand right now and say, yes, Pastor, well, I'm a Christian. God spoke to my heart. There's people, love, somebody I need to love for Christ's sake. Yes, God bless you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for each one of us. I pray especially for those who raise their hands, but for others as well. Help us to love like you loved us. Help us to pray for those people that we don't love. And I pray that we might show your love to people everywhere so that they'll see Jesus Christ in us. Thank you for hearing us. And thank you for ministering through your Holy Spirit in this service give you all the praise and glory. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand please.